I'd just like to thank you for joining us tonight for tonight's webinar, uh, Back to Business, Optimising Lamb and Calf Health. My name is Tasha McGregor and I'm with the Department of Primary Industries and Regions SA and I'll be your host for this evening's webinar. Tonight's webinar is brought to you by Meat and Livestock Australia, Australian Wool Innovation, in partnership with Livestock SA and Primary Industries and Regions SA. We also have some support from the Adelaide Hills Council. Our tonight's presenter for the webinar is Dr. Colin Trengrove, who's a lecturer in ruminant health and production with the University of Adelaide. Colin's keen interest in ruminant nutrition and health has led to a quite a diverse career, um, opportunities across primary industries, mixed veterinary practice, livestock consultancy and academia. He's currently got a few research projects on the go and these include the impact of macro and trace element nutrition on lamb and steer growth, factors impacting lamb loss and the influence of water quality on livestock performance. So in particular um, of interest tonight, Colin, is your work that you've been doing on factors impacting on lamb loss and um, optimising lamb survival. And of course, tonight we've got a bit of a mixed audience, so we'll also touch on um, calf survival as well. So Colin, I'd like to hand over tonight's webinar to you. Okay, thank you, Tasha. And um, good evening to all the uh, viewers. So, um, uh, effectively beginning with the end in mind. So a summary, um, so first of all, um, factors that impact on calf and lamb survival. Uh, so sire selection. So the idea of uh, basically selecting sires that throw uh, moderate sized lambs and or calves uh, is a good way to start. But uh, I won't say much more about that. The next point is uh, managing ewe and cow condition um, so that they're in about a score 3 to 3.3 .3 out of 5. Uh, next point is allocating feed resources. So in this case of sheep, uh, focusing on uh, getting good survival in your twins or your multiples, uh, whereas it's uh, less important in terms of singles. Uh, the next point is uh, mob size. So in the case of sheep, keeping the mob size to less than 250 ewes. Uh, has been recognised now as being um, consistent with getting much better survival rates in, in lambs. Uh, effectively, ideally, selecting dry, warm, clean, sheltered, low predator risk lambing and calving paddocks. Uh, of course, that's easily said, not always easily done, but um, most producers will recognise some paddocks as being uh, a much better option for getting good survival rates than others. And final point there is maintaining good biosecurity uh, and effectively low pasture contamination so that um, uh, newborn animals uh, get off to a good start. Okay, so that's a, a quick overview and now we'll go into the detail. So uh, looking at uh, key performance indicators for getting good reproduction and survival. So these are <clears throat> not set in, in cement, so to speak, but they are really a guide to um, the sort of uh, performance we would be expecting out of um, uh, sheep and cattle, uh, herds, and, herds and flocks. So scanning percentage from a point of view of um, uh, lambs, we'd be like to see at least 130% uh, scanned in lamb. So that is based on the fact that you have 30% ewes that have got twins. Now it's easy to achieve more than double that. Um, so depending on particular bloodlines and of course what, whether we're talking merinos or crossbreds or other various other breeds. But um, conservatively we'd like to see at least 30% um, with twins uh, and effectively about 70% with singles uh, with very few dries. In the case of uh, calving, we'd hope to get um, at least a 95% uh, conception or scanned in calf rate. Uh, now we look next at uh, born alive per 100 uh, ewes or cows joined. And so here we might say uh, from scanning to born alive, um, ideally you might only lose 5% of lambs and 5% uh, of calves. The um, marking weaning uh, for uh, per hundred cows were used joined, and effectively, we don't expect to lose many between marking and weaning, so uh, that's why the marking weaning is uh, uh, slashed together. So, if we were to lose another ten percent lambs between marking, uh, marking, uh, sorry, from uh, unborn from scanning to marking. 
uh, or another potentially 5% of calves. Uh, you or cow mortality rates, so we'd like to see less than 4% of uh, ewes lost annually and less than 3% of cows lost annually. But these, of course, are all provisional on um, not having any uh, unforeseen uh, nutritional issues mainly, which uh, we'll touch on later on. Uh, looking at losses from scanning to weaning, uh, less than 15% would be ideally what we'd like to see, although that can easily be uh, double that figure, uh, and less than 10% in the case of calves. And then looking at um, some other benchmarks, so by the time um, we mark uh, lambs at say six weeks of age, uh, we'd like to see them about 15 kilograms body weight based on effectively a five kilogram birth weight and then a 250 grams a day growth rate. And in the case of calves, uh, 60 kilograms where we'd be expecting say a, around about a 35, 40 kilogram birth weight and then around about four or 500 grams a day growth rate. Uh, and then following through to weaning, so if we're weaning um, lambs at three months or 90 days, uh, we'd like to see at least a 25 kilogram body weight at weaning to ensure a good survival. Uh, and then in the case of calves, if we're weaning say at six months or 180 days, we'd like to see at least 120 kilogram uh, weaning weight. From a uh, ewe condition and lamb survival point of view, uh, so this is data taken from the Lifetime Wool Project, which ran for several years in the early 2000s. And uh, this is just to highlight what impact uh, ewe condition score has on lamb survival. So a couple of WA flock, uh, study flocks here where one was maintained at a condition score of 2.4. So they had a 81% survival in singles. And so it just highlights that um, lamb survival uh, single lamb survival is actually um, is pretty achievable even at a low condition score in the ewe. But in the case of twins, there was only 58% survival. Whereas a, um, a, a typical or similar flock maintained at score 3.5 uh, had a 92% survival in the singles, and that's probably about as good as we can hope for. Uh, and an 82% survival in the twins, which is also what we will consider an optimum survival rate. Uh, and similar study done in two Victorian flocks where um, one, one mob was maintained at 2.2 score, 74% survival in singles and 38% in twins. Uh, and then the other mob maintained at 3.1, 86% survival in the singles and 56 survival in the twins. So it just highlights that if we can maintain animals uh, in roughly a one condition score better, we can expect to get at least um, uh, effectively 30% higher survival rate in twins and perhaps a 10% survival or better survival rate in singles. So that um, has been demonstrated many times now. There's over 5,000 producers have done the lifetime uh, new management program and that's sort of typical of the sort of results we've been seeing. Now moving on to some current research. So this is research being done uh, between us at uh, LA University and Murdoch University and also um, some participants in, in Victoria. Uh, and it's managed uh, by Murdoch University based on MLA funding. And uh, so this is a, a summary of uh, interim results on the results of um, lambing in maiden ewe lambs, so lambs that have been mated around about seven to ten months of age, and uh, then maiden ewe hoggets that have been mated somewhere between about uh, you know, 15 and 18 months of age, or 15 and 20 months of age. And uh, so the maiden ewe lambs are predominantly um, crossbreds or composite breeding, uh, and the maiden ewe hoggets were mainly were all merino. So we see here that scanning rates um, achieved in the first two years of the project uh, up around 112% in lamb, in, in ewe lambs. Uh, but you can see here a wide variation and that will come back purely to um, maturity or uh, body weight at uh, joining. And uh, similarly in maiden ewe hoggets, uh, merino hoggets, we've seen here uh, about 109% scanning rate, but once again, quite a wide variation. Uh, so depending on particular circumstances in some flocks. Uh, marking rates, um, 
we see a significant fall here, uh, down to 71% in maiden ewe lambs and 77% in the hoggets. But once again, a, a wide variation in, uh, uh, so one flock here and had a particular disaster, which is down to a 28% marking. So where are the losses occurring? So if we look at uh, the scanning to birth period, we see uh, on average about 12% and 10%, uh, but some flocks achieved no losses in this period, while others achieved up to 40% losses in this period. And then looking at the uh, birth to marking uh, period, we see here around about 18 to 21% losses, uh, and once again, wide variation. So overall losses from scanning through to marking, about 30% across the uh, maiden ewe lambs and the uh, maiden ewe hoggets. And, uh, and this is typically, typical of what we commonly see uh, across um, a whole range of flocks where that has been monitored. So overall, the percent wastage from scanning through to birth, uh, roughly um, a third, bit over a third of the losses occurred um, pre-birth from scanning to birth, and about two thirds of the losses occurred uh, from birth through to marking. And so this is pretty typical of what we see uh, in, especially in ewe lambs that have been joined for the first time. Whereas in uh, ewe hobbits that have been joined for the first time, uh, a greater proportion of losses have occurred uh, after birth. And most of those losses, in fact, it's usually considered about 70% of losses occur in the first 48 hours uh, after birth. Um, so what can you do to address these issues? So improving conception rate. Uh, so we're looking at better ewe nutrition pre-joining, uh, improved genetics. So where producers are buying uh, rams, for example, or for that matter bulls, uh, using Australian sheep breeding values to uh, select for rams that will produce uh, moderate size birth lambs, or lambs at birth weight, or using the EBVs in the case of bulls to have moderate birth calves. Uh, we should also make sure that um, we do a ram exam or a bull exam prior to joining to ensure that they are, have good breeding soundness and, uh, and so are going to produce good results. From a lamb survival point of view, uh, targeting ewe nutrition during pregnancy and, uh, and certainly that becomes even more important in the latter stages of pregnancy. Uh, so monitoring you condition uh, and the amount of feed on offer. So this is illustrated here. So obviously checking you condition, ideally this is done about every six weeks during pregnancy to as a very good guide is to ensure that getting an adequate energy protein intake, uh, primarily energy. And uh, here we can just showing the pasture rule to indicate whether there's enough feed on offer to uh, m match the animal's needs. And of course, um, in order to know what do you expect, you really need to be able to do preg testing or preg scanning um, at the appropriate time, usually about day 84 in the case of um, uh, ewes. And for that matter, usually around about um, six, six to uh, 12 weeks in the case of uh, cows. So um, if you don't know what you're going to get, you don't know what you've missed out on effectively. Uh, and the last point here is that improving weaner survival. So in the case of uh, merinos in, in, in particular, where you're actually retaining the, uh, the ewe lambs for uh, on, uh, replacements in the flock, we uh, figure if we've got them around about 25 kilos at weaning, uh, then if they just um, put on a kilogram a month, assuming this is over the, um, the summer, Autumn period, uh, that's to enough to enable good survival. It's when they don't make any weight gain that um, you certainly can have significant losses. Okay, so talking about your condition a bit more. So as a routine, as I said, ideally, this is done at least every, uh, around about every six weeks during the uh, pregnancy. Uh, I realise that's a bit of a, it can be a bit of a problem, obviously, if you've got animals uh, far flung, but even if you've got some temporary um, sheep yards, we can set up to do that. And uh, you only have to monitor about 40 or 50 animals in a mob, uh, regardless of mob size, to get a pretty good idea of how they're going. And uh, we're really aiming to keep them in about score three condition. So uh, we've, we know there's a good correlation with having animals with sufficient um, fat on the back, in other words, sufficient condition, that if they're in score three condition, that um, uh, can achieve sort of optimum survival rates in lambs. We don't want them to be too, too thin, or for that matter, too fat, because that also 
predisposes to um, some diseases uh, like um, can be a problem with hypocalcemia or milk fever. Uh, and obviously dystochia can be a bigger issue in fatter animals. And of course, thinner animals are more prone to twin lamb disease or pregnancy toxemia, uh, which we'll touch on again later. So uh, effectively, part of, part of it is condition, condition managing the, or screwing the ewes, but the other part is assessing what's the value of the feed in the paddock. Is there an, enough energy in that paddock uh, to meet the needs of these, um, these animals? Okay, so what do sheep need to eat? So we can start off by saying a ewe uh, at maintenance. Uh, and so these tables here are, I've put in, because effectively most um, ewes that we deal with these days are around about 60 kilograms, whereas a lot of the tables are based on 50 kilogram animals. So we normally say a dry sheep will eat about 2% of its body weight a day. So if it's a 60 kilogram sheep and it's eating uh, you know, moderate, modest um, quality feed in the paddock, it should eat about eat its 10 megajoules a day to maintain itself. Uh, and 8% protein is readily achieved in, in most feeds, except in prep weight, summer autumn, uh, and need modest amounts of calcium. But as we come through to late pregnancy, uh, the appetite goes up, but of course you've got a large fetus or fetuses in their belly, which tends to restrict their feed intake. So 2.8% or just under 3% of their body weight is what you might hope to, um, that they'll consume. Uh, you need a, a better quality feed. So ideally uh, by this stage you are on grain feed or if not you're giving a, a grain supplement to ensure that they can eat their you know, nearly 15 megajoules. So in other words their energy requirements have gone up by nearly 50% in that last four weeks of pregnancy. Uh, their protein requirements have also gone up so it's another reason why you ideally you have them on grain feed or otherwise a, a grain supplement possibly with a bit of um, uh, legume included to up that protein and of course uh, their calcium requirements have gone up markedly because in that late pregnancy stage the fetus is developing the bone structure which needs a, a considerable uh, increase in calcium input uh, as well as phosphorus and, uh, and magnesium they're also important for bone development uh, and that's why if we don't address these issues you end up with with ewes suffering uh, milk fever or hypocalcemia and possibly uh, grass tetany or hypomagnesemia. Uh, then if we go through into lactation, so the um, energy requirements are going up considerably and protein because there's a lot of um, energy and protein going out of the milk. So they can be eating about 4% of their body weight a day, uh, which in the case of a ewe with a single lamb would be around about 25 megajoules, or in the case of a ewe with twins, up to 32 megajoules. And we see here we need a high quality feed, so certainly a, ideally a green feed uh, and, and plenty of crude protein. And the, um, the calcium and phosphorus requirements remain similar because it's um, effectively now it's being going out in the form of milk. Uh, so feed quality is paramount. And I have heard of some recent cases where ewes that have been in confinement and let out just prior to lambing, but uh, have had uh, losses uh, associated with the fact that they haven't been feeding enough energy and protein uh, whilst in confinement. And uh, so hay, for example, is just too low quality. Hay has more like 8% ME and 8% crude protein, whereas you need a higher quality, so basically a grain, a good grain supplement, and probably somewhere between a half and one kilogram per head per day, depending on what else is uh, available. In, the, in that confinement period, or if you're le letting him out of confinement, ideally um, going onto a green feed with obviously uh, this sort of energy protein level. So how can we relate that back to a visual assessment of the feed on offer? So this illustration here is highlighting that um, if, there's, if you've got less than an average of four centimetres of pasture in the paddock, pasture height in the paddock with a good density, so ideally a density like a bowling green or a, or a lawn tennis court, uh, if you've got 4% of um, four centimetres average pasture height, that's going to equate to around about 1,200 kilograms of dry matter per hectare. Uh, and so that should be providing adequate energy and protein in its own right. If you've got a less than an average pasture height of four centimetres, we need to be looking at some additional supplement. Uh, so whether that's a, ideally probably a grain supplement or perhaps a very good quality um, legume hay. 
uh, and looking at that from another illustration point of view. So ideally, we'd like to have around about 12 or 1300 kilos of dry matter on offer. So that's actually an average pasture height of around about four centimetres. And uh, obviously, if we're up around 1700 kilos, in other words, around about five to six centimetre average pasture height, uh, that's ideally uh, what you'd like to see for a ewe with twins or multiples to get good milk production. Uh, and if we talk about um, a cow and calf, we're really looking something more like around about 2,000 to 2,500 kilograms dry matter per hectare, which is an average pasture height of around about seven to eight centimetres. In other words, every centimetre of pasture height represents about 300 kilograms of dry matter on, per hectare on offer. Moving on, so the U energy requirements uh, through to lambing. Uh, so if we talk about, once again, just based on a 60 kilogram U, uh, and this is based on the lifetime U management nutrition tables. So a dry U needs about 10 megajoules a day. Uh, if we go through to uh, <clears throat> what's that, um, four months, in other words, about a, a month off uh, lambing. So the um, energy requirement has gone up significantly for single, but certainly much higher for twins. And uh, if we actually rely on the animal to be utilising, in other words, if we're underfeeding it, if we're not providing it with these megajoules with the feed on offer, either in the form of grain or green feed, uh, we can expect that the animal is going to lose some condition. And so that's why it's, uh, you really need to have them in condition score three or a bit better at lambing. So if they're losing 150 grams a day, for example, um, some of that, obviously the energy from the fat loss is supplementing uh, what they uh, need to eat. So if there's not enough energy in the paddock, they'll lose uh, condition or fat. Uh, and so if they're losing 150 grams a day in body weight, that really equates to about four and a half megajoules. In other words, you really only end up feeding them 10. But that's, that's where it gets dangerous because if you rely too much on uh, utilising their fat instead of um, energy going down their throat, um, that's when you run into the pregnancy toxemia problem. In other words, that's a mild starvation or a moderate starvation uh, and effectively it will eventually kill the animal if you're relying too much on utilising fat fat reserves instead of providing it in the paddock. So um, when you fortnight off lambing, we see here that the um, energy requirements have almost gone up 50% uh, and certainly have in the case of a ewe with twins. And uh, once again, um, if you're not providing enough energy, uh, they can be utilising energy from their uh, fat catabolism or breakdown of fat. Uh, then we go through into lactation and by about day 20 is peak lactation. So we see here the um, energy requirements, 22 megajoules for a ewe with a single lamb or up to um, 32 kilograms. In other words, three times the dry ewe requirement of energy to meet those lactational needs. And normally we would expect that um, the ewe can't possibly eat that in its um, in a day in an intake. So you're relying on, that's why we need to have them in score three or better because they're going to be utilising some of their fat uh, to supplement what they cannot eat. Uh, and so a little bit of fat utilisation is good. In fact, if we expect them to lose a half to one condition score, in other words, five to 10 kilograms of body fat during the uh, lactational phase, which is the first you know, 10 to 12 weeks post lambing, uh, that's, that's a normal thing. But it's a case of don't cause them to utilise too much fat too quickly, otherwise they'll uh, drop dead with preg toxemia. And then we move on to um, uh, seven weeks uh, post lambing, and we see here that the energy requirements are starting to fall off because effectively the, now the lamb is getting some energy from grazing green feed or whatever other hard feeders on offer. Uh, and so there's a less requirement on the ewe to be feeding um, milk. And so the energy requirements of the ewe go down at this point in time. Uh, and so just bearing in mind that uh, we're just talking here energy. Uh, protein, normally if they're on grade feed, they'll be getting enough protein. And so that's not an issue. Uh, if they're on dry feed, uh, you may need to focus on protein supplementation as well, which uh, normally we would say is some form of legume supplement by the good quality legume hay or, um, or lupins or peas or beans, uh, for example, uh, grain. 
Uh, and so we need to be also conscious of this need for calcium, phosphorus and magnesium, both pre-lambing and in that lactational phase. Okay, so key uh, lamb survival strategies, uh, managing food on offer and new nutrition to achieve condition score targets. And effectively, that's um, 3 to 3.3 3, uh, right through pregnancy. Providing shelter to reduce wind speed and chill factor. We'll come back to that shortly. Focusing on um, feeding the ewes with twins or triplets, because that's where you're going to get increased lamb survival. Uh, as we've mentioned earlier, ewes with single lambs generally um, can, can get away with a lot less energy and still get good survival rates. Uh, restricting mob size to minimise mismothering. I'll come on to that shortly. Uh, preventing dystochia by in keeping ewes in, in modest condition. In other words, score three, um, not too fat and not too skinny. Uh, and of course, um, uh, selecting size that throw moderate birth weights. Uh, and then of course, generally just good nutrition to ensure good animal health. So if we talk about um, mob size, so here we're talking about the number of ewes lambing per day and lamb survival. So if we've got a mob of ewes with single lambs, or signal pregnancies. We see here that whether you've got up to 16 lambs being born a day or 32 or even 48, that uh, you can still get good survival rates because effectively that not, is not impacting on um, mothering ability. In other words, there are not that many lambs around that's causing mismothering. However, if we look at a, um, a mob of twin lambing ewes, uh, we see here that um, if you're only getting 16 lambs a day, we we can expect you know, ideally up around 80 plus percent survival rate, or even with up to 32 lambs a day, you're getting around about 80%. So that's good results. But once you get above that um, magic figure, uh, when you're getting a high number of lambs being born each day, uh, the mismothering causes uh, a considerable lamb loss. So how do we work that out? So if we talk about, um, in an ideal circumstance, two thirds of lambs are born on the first cycle if, um, if the joining period all went to plan with 17 days. And so if you've got a 200 twinning uh, twin ewe mob, uh, that means they're going to be producing around about eight lambings a day, which is equivalent to 16 lambs a day. Uh, and so that's considered a, um, a low density lambing. Uh, and so we can expect these ideal survival rates. I mean, some would say 83% is still not ideal, but in practical terms, that's what you can expect to get. However, if we had a much bigger mob size, uh, looking at say 500 uh, twin lambing ewes in a mob, so that equates to about 19 lambings a day or 38 lambs a day. And so that's considered a high density lambing. And uh, that's where we have a considerable amount of mismothering going on, uh, resulting in a much lower survival rate in twins. Now, what are the causes of neonatal lamb loss? So this was a study, uh, four studies actually combined in WA, uh, where they looked at the uh, doing postmortems on lambs 40 days, uh, 48 hours after birth. And so the percentage of uh, causes of neonatal lamb loss, uh, so the what we call the SME, the starvation mismothering exposure complex, accounts for anything up to about two thirds of lamb losses generally. And uh, of course, this is going to vary considerably on circumstances, on the uh, type of paddock that uh, they're lambing in, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, dystochia or difficult birth accounted for anything up to um, a third of, uh, of um, lamb losses, but also obviously considerable ewe losses as well. Whereas some of these other issues that often uh, are considered significant uh, usually aren't in most situations. So infection, uh, this can cause, of course include abortion, there's generally only a, a low percentage. Predation is often uh, gets overinflated. I appreciate in certain circumstances where foxes or eagles or wild dogs uh, can cause predation well over 10%, but on average, um, it tends to be less than 10%. Uh, there's always gonna be some situations where you just cannot identify the cause of loss uh, based on a postmortem. Uh, and then there's always gonna be some losses that occur prenatally. Whoops, uh, and so um, you know, this once again may be a, uh, associated with um, prevailing conditions or infections or other issues at the time. I put this little um, 
illustration in here. So you can actually do a, a five minute post-mortem on a dead lamb. And generally most times you'll work out, well, as it's indicated here, probably up to 90% of the time, you can work out the cause of loss. Uh, and perhaps one of the most significant ones is actually, you just use a pair of um, pruning shears or foot shears and snip the top of the skull off and have a look at the brain. Now, if it's nice and pink with no blood, you'd say, okay, that's quite a healthy brain. Whereas in this illustration, where you've got a whole lot of uh, blood in amongst the um, crevices in the brain surface, that's indicating this animal uh, died under duress or stress. Uh, and so it was probably a difficult birth uh, and you've got some brain hemorrhage. Now, this can obviously be fatal to the lamb or commonly these lambs um, end up being dummies in that they've got brain injury, but it doesn't kill them. And so then they end up wandering around aimlessly, not knowing to suckle. Uh, and so they fall into this starvation, mismothering exposure complex. So it's generally considered that often up to two thirds of lambs that die uh, at birth or in the first 48 hours are associated with a brain injury. So if you want to um, get some foot shears or some pruning snips, just take the skull off the lamb. Uh, you can make a pretty quick diagnosis as to whether that was the cause of death. Uh, and uh, so it's quite a useful strategy to do that. Okay, so this uh, horrible looking table, I put it in there only to highlight the fact that there are a lot of different things that can cause uh, lamb loss. And uh, <coughs> this um, obviously hasn't changed much. This was actually a table I had in my notes when I uh, graduated over 40 years ago. And uh, so if we just do a quick breakdown, so it's what it's illustrating here from week one through to um, parturition or full term uh, lamb, so 21 weeks, uh, we can see when these, when these different causes uh, result in lamb loss. Uh, so I'll just do a quick summary. So the first three there are nutritional, under nutrition, high plane nutrition, selenium deficiency, uh, then climate, which obviously seasonal conditions, well, continuous high temperatures can impact, um, especially during the joining period in terms of getting uh, embryo survival. Uh, then we have uh, a whole array of toxins. Some of these are not necessarily poisonous weeds we see in our environment, uh, but some are. Um, then we move through to microbial causes of lamb loss. So these are primarily um, bacteria, but there are some viruses there as well. And these are the ones that we do have in the country. There's another six or eight which are considered exotic to our environment, um, or in other words, foreign animal diseases. And we see here that most of the microbial ones um, generally cause losses in the last third of pregnancy. Uh, so if we zoom in on those a bit more, so under nutrition, uh, so this is going to be normally associated with underfeeding, as we talked about earlier, so leading to pregnancy toxemia, and that will cause, um, can often cause well, underfeeding. This is actually uh, back at joining time. Uh, if they're in poor condition, you'll often get embryo loss in the first three weeks. Um, and then pregnancy toxemia in the latter stages of pregnancy here. Uh, if you've got too much feed on offer, uh, you can end up causing embryo loss during the joining period. So too much of a good thing, uh, especially uh, nitrogen or nitrate. Uh, and then a couple of the um, more common bacterial causes of uh, lamb loss that we've seen, uh, particularly in recent times, and I've heard of stories on Kangaroo Island as well as uh, mainland. So Campylobacter, or what we used to call Vibrio or Vibriosis, uh, that certainly is recognised to cause lamb losses uh, annually in South Australia. Uh, and that always occurs in about the last month or two of pregnancy. Uh, and the other one is uh, Toxoplasma which even though it's only recognised as being spread by wild cats, it's amazing how common wild cats are. And we do find quite a bit of evidence of toxoplasmosis on uh, the mainland, uh, but certainly it's a, a bigger issue on Kangaroo Island. Once again, causing abortion in the last um, four weeks of uh, pregnancy. So we can talk about that later if anyone would like to uh, more, more information. So managing um, primarily our twin ewes to get better survival rates. So allocating feed resources to ensure they've got enough feed on offer um, and preferably obviously green feed that's at least four centimetres high. Maintaining small or relatively small stop, um, mob sizes. Uh, providing shelter, we know that um, we can get a significant in increase in survival of twins and singles just by providing shelter. It doesn't have to be a think flash. 
even just uh, cutting grass or phalaris, uh, uh, for example, uh, left around is enough to provide shelter because you're really wanting to cut down the wind speed at lamb height. And so if you can cut the uh, wind speed down by 10 kph or kilometres uh, per hour at lamb height, you can get a, a, a like a 10% improvement in, in lamb survival. But if you've got plantations, uh, it's considered the benefit extends 10 times the height of the plantation. Uh, and the other one is just avoiding high risk paddocks. And we've, and of course, predator, predator control, uh, more important in where those areas where it can be an issue. <clears throat> okay, I'm a bit conscious of time, so I've got to keep rolling on. So ideally, uh, lambs should be born between four and six kilos of age. So we see these little lambs here, 1.2 kilo, um, up to two or three kilo, they're almost born to die because they just don't have enough energy to survive, to suckle. <clears throat> Whereas if we come over here, we've got these lambs that are six or seven or up to eight kilos, they're just um, waiting to be a dystopia, a difficult birth. And so they also have a very low chance of survival. So this is just an illustration from a, a, lamb, a lamb workshop we did on KI at one stage. So this illustration highlights lamb birth weight. So if you're looking at getting good survival rates, you really need to have lambs born somewhere between four and six kilos. Uh, it's quite common if ewes aren't in good enough condition that twin, lamb, twin lambs are born below four kilograms. And so that increases their uh, likelihood of being lost. Uh, conversely, if we have um, ewes that are over conditioned or sires that throw too big a lamb, uh, we can expect higher death rates above six kilos in merinos or above um, you know, seven kilos in crossbreds or or in uh, composites. Uh, Radio. So perhaps uh, just uh, to finish up on this, so if you have um, scanned in lamb and found that you should get around about 125% lambing, uh, which is quite achievable, um, a lot of merino flocks now get over 150%. Uh, so we see here that if you're getting survival rates, typically around about 80% of singles and 50% of twins, join 100 ewes, probably get 9% not in lamb, 57% uh, with singles, uh, which means you'll mark about 46% uh, scanned in lamb, 34, so you'll get 68 lambs potentially, but you'll only mark 34 because you get 50% survival. So total marking is going to be 80, which means that an overall lamb survival from scratch is 64%. But if you can uh, maintain use in score three to 3.3, 3, uh, you'll get much better survival in singles than twins, as we illustrated early on. If you go through the figures again, uh, it means you should get around about a total of 100% lambs marked and end up losing about um, uh, an overall lamb survival of 80%. So highlighting that um, having ewes in better condition, uh, you can improve your overall lamb survival by 15% 15, 15 or better. Okay, so just um, moving on to successful calf rearing. Um, I'll have a lot less to say about this. So, um, so getting a good start, uh, essential for good health and production. We need to keep cows in good condition. So just as we talked about ewes, we like to see cows in score three out of five, uh, out of a scale of five um, at calving, because once again, we expect them to lose a condition score during lactation. And calving management, uh, we really need to focus on attending any dystochias or different calvings uh, in a timely manner. Um, if you can get there, uh, if the legs are showing and nothing happens within 20 minutes, I would certainly step in and pull the calf. There's really no minimal risk in pulling a calf, uh, even if it's going to calve on its own, but leaving it um, with the feet hanging out for a couple of hours is a sure sign if you're going to have a dead calf. Uh, using good hygiene, if you do any calvings, um, using disinfection, uh, cleaning up afterwards so that the, the cow doesn't get a residual infection. And, uh, and ideally, you would apply a bit of iodine to the navel just to minimise that risk if you are intervention, if there's intervention, in other words, if you are involved in that uh, it's a more stressful experience for the cow and the calf so putting a bit of iodine spray on the navel is a good idea and then ideally uh, milking out some colostrum for the calf or putting the calf on the udder uh, because that early intake of colostrum is fundamental to getting good calf um, immunity and survival uh, ensuring that the calf does um, suckle effectively 
Uh, and if we're talking um, in other situations where, uh, for example, if you're a calf rearer, uh, what we ideally look for in calf rearing situations, well ventilated, draft free, clean, dry environment. Effectively, uh, that's optimised the survival rate. And so the same applies whether you've got a calf in a paddock or a calf in a shed. Uh, from a calf mortality point of view, uh, in dairies, we can see anywhere from two to 60%, depending on um, all those hygiene issues we just talked about. But well-managed farms can keep um, calf mortality rates less than 0.5% uh, year, year on year. So we really aim for about, um, uh, in mature cows, a loss of around about no more than 3% or 6% in heifers. Whereas in a beef enterprise, uh, one to seven percent calf loss um, per year, but some farms once again have significant losses if they have a, a, a scars infection or a respiratory infection. Uh, so we're really aiming to get sort of a two percent um, death rate uh, potentially in cows, and of course um, excluding predation. So the hygiene in terms of um, calves in a rearing facility is fundamental to whether you're going to get good survival rates. And uh, the other issue is, a, is attention to detail at um, calving. So if there's any hint of a, a dystochia, uh, get in there and, uh, and pull it rather than leave it for too long. And the biggest risk, of course, if it's a breech birth with the tailors coming out, because you may not see, if you're not watching, um, those cows are, calves will be dead before you even notice that cow's trying to calve. Uh, so calf management, we're really looking at um, in the case where you are attentive and dealing with calves, ideally you would put an iodine spray on the navel, um, but that's obviously not going to be practical in a lot of beef situations. So you're really wanting to keep the environmental contamination to a minimum. In other words, not having high stocking rates where there's a lot of dung and urine in the paddock where the calves or the cows are trying to calve in. Uh, so not high stock density. Uh, colostrum, so Assisting the calf to suckle if it hasn't sucked within four hours is a, is a sure way of ensuring they get an adequate amount of colostrum. Uh, given the, if the cow's in good health and well fed, she'll have high quality colostrum. And so a, a litre of colostrum is considered adequate intake. Um, if it's some delay in attending to that calf or getting a, a feed, if it hasn't had any colostrum in the first 12 hours, it probably really needs two litres to ensure it's getting good immunity. So good passive transfer of antibodies from the cow to the calf. Once again, if you're involved in um, calf rearing or for that matter, intervention with calving, ensuring good hygiene, and of course, um, and keeping an eye on things, so good husbandry procedures. From a um, cow management point of view, uh, certainly we fundamentally recommend clostridial vaccination in, in for that matter use and cows ideally uh, a month before uh, calving or lambing to ensure the cow is passing on that antibody or good immunity through the calf through that uh, through the colostrum. If there are problems with uh, res respiratory diseases, which are not uh, were relatively common in calves and, and lambs for that matter especially ones that are uh, reared as orphans or uh, away from their mothers. Uh, and so I've just put in this illustration here of, um, so this is normal healthy lung tissue at an abattoir's and all these dark tips, uh, pneumonia, where it's consolidated, it's full of fluid, full of microorganisms. Uh, and so that's really limiting the animal's uh, lung capacity. And we commonly see this in, in calves and lambs at slaughter. Uh, there's a lot of pneumonia that goes unnoticed and obviously it would be hampering their growth rates uh, and effectively uh, can kill them if it um, affects more than 30 or 40% of the lung. And the other major cause of calf loss, of course, is calf scars. The number of different viruses and uh, bacteria that will cause calf scars, depending if it occurs in the first week or second week or the first month of life as to what the likely cause is uh, and also what the likely treatment is. But often if you've got calves that are developing scars within the first, um, uh, month, uh, if you feed them electrolytes, uh, you can often get them to recover without having to use antibiotics. So sachets of powder, which have got the um, electrolytes, the um, calcium, magnesium, uh, chloride, sulfur, uh, and the like in them, uh, you can generally uh, get them to survive. Here's a typical calf loss from scouring. It's got sunken eyes indicating dehydration. 
a very um, shrunken body and a yellow scar at the tail end. So um, vaccination is always a good idea, but don't expect that to solve your problems if, um, if management's not up to scratch. When do uh, getting a, a calf to develop is obviously all about getting it to eat uh, solid feeds. So in the first um, two or three weeks, it's relying entirely on uh, milk diet, uh, whether that's um, cow's milk or a milk replacer. And uh, they will be nibbling on dry feed, but relying mainly on milk. Then they go through this transitional phase for the next um, few weeks where they start to eat dry feed. Uh, that helps the rumen to develop and the, um, the little finger light -like projections in the rumen wall, which enables them to um, uh, absorb nutrient and make and turn it, ferment it and turn it into energy. Uh, and so ideally, if you've got an adequate amount of feed on offer, uh, that's going to happen naturally. Um, if there's not much feed around, well, then you'll need to be providing a good quality hay and or grain to encourage that rumen development. And there's no doubt if you're feeding them with solids from an early age, uh, for example, calf rearers can put solids in there from day one. And as the lambs, uh, our calves, should I say, or for the matter lambs, um, eat that solid, uh, <clears throat> they will develop their rumen more quickly uh, so that they can be weaned at an earlier age. But normally we wouldn't aim to wean a lamb under eight weeks of age. Uh, and, and certainly not a calf under 12 weeks and probably preferably uh, five or six months of age. But when the uh, calf is eating at least a kilograms of solid feed a day, then they've probably got a rumen well enough developed that they can be weaned. Okay, so uh, I did rush that through a bit, but I was conscious of the time, Tasha, so um, we better pull up there and have some questions. Thank you. Sounds like a good idea. Um, excellent. Thanks for that, Colin. That was really, really interesting and very informative. Uh, let's see, we do have a question here. What is your knowledge around heat stress mitigation throughout mating and or gestation in sheep? Okay, yep, there's no doubt um, heat is a significant issue and whilst we, uh, we encourage producers uh, to ideally lamb in that um, mid to late winter, early spring period. And so that in other words, we're going to be joining them in that um, January, February, March period. There is a high risk of um, heat. Uh, and primarily at that stage, it's really affecting the probably the sires or the rams more than the ewes. Uh, so if you've got um, basically more than about three days with um, ambient temperatures above 37 degrees, uh, that can cook the semen. Uh, and also, of course, the, uh, the rams can die just from heat exhaustion. But um, if the uh, semen quality is down, uh, <clears throat> the, um, yeah, we can result in obviously poor fertilisation or otherwise uh, that ambient elevated temperature can result in early embryo loss. So the embryos, uh, whether we're talking cattle or sheep, uh, take about two weeks from fertilisation um, to be implanted in the wall of the uterus. And once it's implanted or attached, uh, it's a much more robust unit. But in those first two weeks um, after fertilization, they're very vulnerable to any sort of stress. And heat, heat is just one of the stresses that can result in early embryo loss. Uh, and so, um, yeah, that's, that's when probably heat has the biggest impact. Uh, once you've got um, the embryo implanted, um, yeah, heat is going to be a much less of an issue. All right, excellent. Thanks, Colin. I've just got another question come in. Do you have a recommendation for cattle for five in one versus seven in one? So not quite um, lamb or cattle uh, calf survival, but um, definitely an important question. Yes. Okay. No, that's uh, that's always a good point. The um, uh, often, for example. From a sheep perspective, we say we really only have tetanus and uh, enterotoxemia are the two main causes of um, deaths in sheep in South Australia. So we send, generally say a three in one is adequate. But these days, uh, manufacturers often only provide a five in one. Uh, in the case of cattle, um, you've also got the two leptospira uh, inclusions in the vaccine. So that's the seven in one. So leptospira or leptospirosis uh, is considered a um, potentially a cause of abortion in cattle and, and it can occur in sheep too, uh, but probably it's a bigger risk to human health. So being a zoonosis, uh, we can also acquire leptospira. And so it's a particularly a bigger issue in uh, dairying operations where you've got a much 
It's made a risk of perhaps being sprayed by urine, uh, which is where um, Leptospira is primarily spread. It's obviously also spread in um, uh, aborted materials or for that matter in, in membranes uh, at calving. And so if you're in intensive um, beef operation or a dairying operation, we'd always recommend 7 in 1. If it's more an extensive um, circumstance where you're not likely to come in contact with uh, urine, um, probably 5 in 1 is adequate. Uh, but any sort of um, higher rainfall area, probably 7 in 1 is, is a good safeguard uh, because it can obviously cause abortion as well as being a human health risk. Okay. Uh, Colin, do you have any comments? Um, this person's obviously had some um, difficulties with calves. So the calves that are born have had poor vision and other defects, such as missing the upper palate and lumps on the cheek. What right. does that sound like? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm just thinking I might um, roll back. Um, where can we get that? What so you when we talk about... Um, you're talking about uh, anomalies in terms of the uh, uh, that was in lambs wasn't it Tasha? No it was in calves. Oh in calves okay yeah. oh, um, actually uh, well it's actually still this is still relevant um, so because a lot of these diseases actually are the same in calves and, and lambs so what we call border disease in uh, sheep is called pestivirus, well it's actually pestivirus in sheep as well, in, in sheep and cattle, but pestivirus or mucosal disease or bovine virus diarrhea and border disease or hairy shaker disease are all the same thing. Uh, in cattle, um, yeah, it's caused by pestivirus called bovine virus diarrhea or mucosal disease in cattle uh, and that is known, it's quite prevalent in the beef industry in Australia, it's considered that probably 80% of herds have evidence of having the disease present uh, and it becomes a particular problem especially in when you introduce um, heifers uh, or cattle onto your property that haven't been exposed to the virus and uh, depending on what stage of um, uh, joining through to um, mid-pregnancy that the virus affects the animals you'll end up with either dead or stillborn calves or calves that are born weak and die or ones that have got um, blindness uh, yeah, cleft palate, uh, missing jaw bones, there's a whole host of things that can cause. So that's probably the most likely cause of um, what the um, uh, the inquirer is referring to. It's most likely going to be pestivirus in the case of cattle. And uh, you can actually have other other concerns as viruses called a Cabani virus, which is another one that tends to occur more in the subtropics. Sometimes it might come into our northern pastoral zone. Uh, but most of these other diseases really just result in abortion uh, as opposed to um, blindness and deformities. Uh, and so probably the answer there is that um, you can readily diagnose pestivirus by doing a bit of a serology across different age groups in a herd or for that matter in a, in a flock and uh, establish um, if it is there. And if it is, then you can actually go through serologically and work out Seriously, serially, and work out which animals are carrying the virus and cull them. And often you'll have to cull not only the um, the dam but the offspring, uh, because it is generally spread from dam to offspring through a herd or a flock. Uh, and you can also vaccinate against it. So a lot of people do vaccinate routinely against pestivirus if they've had problems in the past uh, with abortions or um, this issue with stillborn animals or animals that are born weak and die afterwards. Yeah, sound, sounds quite quite bad. Um, do you sort of recommend that they, they seek some assistance from their local vet or? Yeah, certainly if you're seeing um, calves born blind or um, weaking, weak and die or um, dying in that, certainly in that first 12 months of life, um, you'd be highly suspicious that it would be a pestivirus. And pestivirus is actually, um, it's probably not a good analogy, but it's the AIDS, AIDS virus of cattle in that it, it suppresses their immune system. So it predisposes them to more problems with um, arthritis, uh, with mastitis, with respiratory conditions, with scours, uh, because it's a immunosuppressant. Um, yeah, they, they might die from another problem, but it can be an underlying pestivirus infection. So getting your vet out to do a, a serological survey, you can actually just take a notch out of the ear 
and send it in to see uh, which animals may be carrying the virus uh, also. So, yeah, you know, it, it might cost a few hundred dollars to do a survey, but it's the best way to identify if that's the issue and then and perhaps in, instrumenting, instrumenting a, um, a vaccination program to prevent further losses. Yeah, it sounds like great advice, Colin. We've got some lots of questions coming in, so we'll try and push through as many as we can. Uh, this person's got landing ewes and talking about shy feeders and lick feeders. Um, so the ewes are trained into lick feeders from joining, but they, they drop from their three to 3.5 body score to between one and two. And that's re resulted in high levels of preg tox and ewe mortality. Any advice in terms of yeah, having ewes uh, with lick feeders? Uh, yeah, look, it's always a problem um, whether you're talking lick feeders or even lick blocks or mineral licks. There's always a percentage of animals that just don't uh, take to them. And uh, it's probably important that whenever you're confining animals uh, and putting them on lick feeders, that uh, in that first two weeks, identify those animals which are, are losing condition or are not appearing to attend or go to the lick feeders. I appreciate that may be a bit time consuming to work that out, but really those animals need to be removed and, and treated separately. They obviously are not handling the, um, perhaps the confinement uh, as well as they should, or they just don't um, like the idea of using a lick feeder, but that's inevitably a problem in, in either weaners or, or ewes. Um, but there's always a proportion that don't um, adapt or adopt uh, lick feeders. And the only way to deal with them is to isolate them, uh, put them in a, a separate hospital um, pen or yard or whatever, uh, and, and perhaps feed them by a different means, by trail feeding or, or some other um, form of ensuring they get adequate nutrition. Again, it really shows that importance of keeping those ewes in that good body condition score, doesn't it? Like once it drops, then you've got those issues of preg tox and ewe mortality. Yeah, for sure. And uh, whilst we say um, ideally monitor the ewe condition uh, relatively frequently during pregnancy, of course, once you've got lambs on the ground, um, uh, by and large, left to their devices. So, uh, yeah, that's that's where it can be tricky. Um, ideally, you know, we always recommend that uh, lambing is done in the paddock, uh, not in confinement. I know a number of people have um, lambed in confinement and got good results. But if you've got animals that are not adapting to lick feeders, well, um, you know, really the only thing you can do is ideally turn them out into a paddock where there's enough feed on offer of quality and quantity to meet their needs. Um, and um, so identifying animals that are, are not responding to lick feeders is um, you know, the only way you're going to get those to survive probably. <clears throat> uh, Colin, just looking for some comments on twin lamb survival versus stocking density. And is there um, any correlation between lamb survival in large mobs versus the area that mob is confined to? Uh, yeah, uh, good question. And look, there has been a, a lot of research done on that in the last five years across the uh, country. Uh, there's been studies that have been done across all southern states. And uh, it's been well established that, um, uh, and that's why we use that 250 U cutoff. So ideally, if you have uh, scanned and you've worked out which U's have got multiple uh, pregnancies, ideally, um, you keep uh, use with twins, uh, especially mature or adult use, uh, less than a mob of 250. And if they're maiden use, uh, less than a mob of 150. Uh, so we've seen from these studies that it's not so much the size of the paddock, but it's more the stock density. So um, the uh, so um, the having maiden use in a mob of 150 or less, or uh, or mature ewes, uh, less than 250 in the mob, uh, will get much better survival rates. Uh, and it's just because you've got the lower density of lambing and so less mismothering. Whereas if you're running in mob sizes of, you know, three, four, five or six, 600 ewes, um, especially if they're twinners, um, you can just expect there's going to be a, a much higher density of lambing and uh, resulting in a lot of mismothering going on. So yeah, that, that's been well established through a number of trials now. Excellent. We're, we're running out of time now, Colin. There's a few questions that I haven't got to. So what we might say is we'll follow them up on an individual basis. Um, but just as tonight's, uh, part of tonight's presentation, I just wanted to remind people um, that are in particular in the fire scar areas um, that we would like to inform you of future opportunities that 
uh, may support you on your recovery journey. Um, MLA is offering producers in five affected regions access to three free one-on-one -on -one sessions with local farm management consultants uh, to help them put their businesses back on track. So if you are interested in this opportunity, please contact uh, Livestock SA. And also people, again, within the fire scar, um, if you're interested in applying for the PERSA Emergency Response in Primary Industries grant, uh, these need to be submitted by the 31st of July. And if you, again, are interested, uh, follow up on the PERSA website. So just into conclusion tonight, I just want to thank everyone who joined us for tonight's webinar. Colin, we thank you for sharing your insight and your expertise. And we also thank the sponsors of this webinar, in particular, MLA and AWI. If you have any additional technical questions regarding tonight's topic, please contact myself. So I think for now, we do the value to the time, we'll leave it at that. And we thank you for your time and have a wonderful evening.